Welcome to the Freelance Drive. Here we talk with skilled freelancers about their professional journey. Stay tuned for real life experiences to learn and actionable steps to take to improve your freelancing career. My name is Yuri. I'm a community builder at Code Control and 9am.works. And my guest is Lizette Sutherland, a fractional head of remote, scrum master, and author of the Work Together Anywhere handbook, keynote speaker, the Collaboration Superpowers podcast host, and a huge remote work advocate who is totally jazzed by the fact that it's possible to work from anywhere. And today we'll talk about how to engage people in an online meeting in a way that makes it meaningful and valuable for them and productive. So welcome, Lizette. Thanks. I have to make one small correction because I don't want people to think that I'm an actual scrum master. It does say scrum master in my LinkedIn. It's like a, but that's like the role as a conference director. So for all you real scrum it. masters out there, no, it's good. No, <laughs> but I would just say for all you real scrum masters out there, uh, I'm just a conference director. Next time we'll have this conversation, I will add it like not a real scrum not master. Not a real scrum master, yeah. <laughs> and and I, I really want to shout out this amazing person, Steinje, who recommended to have us conversation this. So let's let's say great thank you for Steinje and let's continue yeah, this conversation. Lots of love to Steinje. So uh, during COVID, online was like, oh my God, it's like lifesaver, nothing else. Everyone started webinars, online meetings, everything. And then kind of like Zoom fatigue happened and people like, oh my God, I, I'd better meet in person and do something online. So how do you personally feel about online events now? Uh, well, the bar has been raised with online events. And uh, what I think a lot of people are still doing now is broadcasting information. Like in webinars, you just go and you see voice in a slide and not even like good, good well-designed slides necessarily or a good story, right? It's, and so basically what you're creating is a whole bunch of bad YouTube videos. And if you were watching any of these things on YouTube, you would go at double speed, right? And so or not even watch it at all, right? Eight minutes in, you would you would drop off. But for some reason, the webinar format keeps sticking around, even though there's lots of ways to make it more engaging. It's just, um, you know, how much time do you want to put into a webinar? It just depends on, or your presentation. It just depends on, uh, on the situation. But uh, I always like to go back to Zig Ziglar whenever designing any sort of webinar. And Zig Ziglar was a famous US sales guy. And he always used to say, You've got to listen to WII FM radio, which is what's in it for them. Like every presentation, event, whatever you're doing should always start in what's in it for the audience. What are they going to get at the end of the event? Because if you just say, join my event, I mean, I'm like, scroll. I've got, you know, I've got stuff to do. Scroll. Like, tell me what I get. And so that's the angle. And it sounds really easy to say, but it is surprisingly hard to do. Even to this day, I find myself writing LinkedIn invites from the perspective of like, oh, it's so exciting. This thing is so exciting and without anything for the audience. But that's, uh, you know, that's where you start. So usually we have two sides. We have host and we have a guest. And for a guest, it's always like, yeah, definitely. I'm happy to speak. Yes, please do. Let's do it. So who has to think about what's in need for them? facilitator has to think about what's in it for the guest. It's the facilitator's job. So that's why I think when you're designing your event, you're designing it for what, how can I give the most value to the people that are coming? How can I give the most value? So it's not me presenting information that everybody needs to know. It's how can I deliver the most value? And, you know, now that video is so prevalent, I'm just not a fan of, I mean, I do plenty of webinars to this day. I'm just not a fan of the one-to-many presentation because it's all on YouTube and better done with higher quality. It's all better explained somewhere, you know, <laughs> it's already, it seems like. So, you know, there is value in them, but I'm really up for, I've always been up for interactive events. Even from the beginning with Collaboration Superpowers, almost 15 years ago now, we started with interactive online workshops. And that's sort of been our, our unique selling point ever since because everybody can do an e-course, but live interactive workshops, that's hard to do. So that's how we got so good at them is we just did thousands. Yeah, I'm just 
just do a lot, do a lot of mistakes, learn from mistakes, sometimes repeat those mistakes, learn once again, and here we are. So in a remote work setting, we have workshops, we have town hall meetings, we have weekly stand-ups, we have weird talk working sessions, like we have anything. So I'm curious, uh, what event serves what purposes? Oh yeah, it's a... Uh... Listen, a town hall is really good if you're doing, you know, one to many communication, but you want questions and answers and things like that. You know, I want it to be sort of interactive at the end or, you know, it's like it's like a conference room sort of you're sort of representing that um, virtual co-working. You know, it depends on how people do it, but that's all about I do this. We run virtual co-working sessions every Friday uh, and it's all about accountability. It's a bunch of freelancers who come, you know, I use it for. I'll say, I have a pile of tasks that are just really hard to get through. It's just a bunch of little things that I don't want to do. And I use those sessions to plow through those tasks because I know by the end I've got, it's just that accountability. That's just how, you know, it just the brain works. That's why personal trainers exist. Like everybody can do the exercises at home, right? You can do squats and push-ups yourself. Sometimes you just need a personal trainer to tell you. Um, I forgot the question now. I got all sidetracked. Yeah, it's about uh, service uh, purposes uh, of each event. So basically, you describe town hall, uh, we're talk working session, then we have workshops, weekly stand ups. Yeah, you know, weekly stand ups, uh, you know, that's for updating each other. And I really believe in that uh, asynchronous is very powerful and should, and the synchronous stand ups, the synchronous time together should be used sparingly. There's just too many meetings. And as we saw, the like too many virtual meetings is not healthy. You need breaks in between. You know, you've got to move and stand up. People are tied to the computer. That's not a natural. That's just not natural. That's why all that Zoom fatigue happened. And then for the last one, it was stand ups and workshops. Workshops. Oh, the interactive. That's all about learning from each other. That's all about how do you bring out the expertise that's already in the room? Like as a workshop facilitator, I'm not there to tell people what they need to know. I'm there to guide the conversation and bring out what people already know so we can learn from each other. So all of those things serve a different purpose and that's all in the design. And how to understand that you really need to have this online meetup, whatever it is. Like how do, how do you know if you need it to begin with? Yeah, I mean, like, how do you know if you need it, if um, it's not better just to send an email or do some async uh, catch up? You know, if you're, if you're working with a team, then that is a, that's something that the team needs to work out for themselves. You create an agreement together about how you're going to work together, what's going to be async and what's going to be sync. Um, yeah, so you can design, you know, meetings that way. I know there's some teams that use meeting techniques like they'll wait, they'll use agenda buildup. They'll wait until, you know, you'll put things on the agenda, like using a Trello board or something. And mm. then you'll meet when the agenda gets long enough to have a, something that's worth meeting about or something's urgent, right? But until then, you just build up the agenda. And then, you know, my facilitators and I, we have a weekly, we, we have a weekly check-in and the agenda gets attitude during the week and then during the week we take care of all the things that have been added to the agenda at that point like a chick 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 but it's just like a quick going through the the points kind of thing so it's all about yeah if, depending on async sync if you're working on a team it's all about working that out between a team if you're working with clients same thing it's just you have multiple team agreements how to structure an event in a way that it really brings value to people and it's not just hosted for the sake of hosting it for me, it's uh, one, you have to be really clear why you're there, right? And what's in it for the people and don't talk too long, like five minutes tops. And then you're doing something interactive. If you can't do something interactive or you're breaking out into different rooms or talking to each other, then at least insert a poll or a break or a short video or uh, some music or just something or a chat storm. I mean, at the very least, right? There's some things you can do to make it even interactive if we can't talk to each other. And then there's some great tools like virtual offices that I'm a big fan of, these virtual spaces. I'm experimenting like crazy right now with these. And uh, that's the best thing I've ever seen. 
I mean, if you're going to do an event online, because these virtual spaces give the participants the autonomy to move themselves from room to room. So we have events where there's four topics, people can choose a topic. And then when they're tired of that one room or it's going nowhere, they just move to another topic, just like you would in a normal room together, like an in-person room together. Is it like this virtual offices uh, and a application where you kind of play games and where you have your avatar and you go from place to place and like join some rooms, join some houses, and you can even join some other locations? Yes, exactly. That's, uh, that's it. But it's not really games. I mean, right now I'm working with a team in a virtual office and what it's really good for is creating presence with each other because I can see the, the, the dev teams in a stand-up meeting right now. Cliff is talking with a customer, hmm. Aileen and there, they're talking about the newsletter. Oh yeah. Henrique just got out of his meeting. He's back in his office. I'm going to go catch him real quick. I mean, you feel like you're working with people. Because it's just on your screen and you're, you know, you can just see where everybody is. So it's kind of amazing. And I'm, I'm always surprised that these technologies haven't cut, haven't cut on more. And also, does it mean that you are always kind of online? And for example, if you are, let's say, I don't know, sitting in a coffee room and someone is approaching you, like your mic and your headphones are turned on and someone can just start talking to you? Yeah, that is possible. I mean, you can lock rooms. You don't have to have, you know, you can say do not disturb, you know, so you can make it so that somebody has to knock first before they come in. So there's all kinds of setups to keep your privacy. But yeah, it really simulates what it's like to be in an office together. Mm. Because in an office and everybody's like, oh, but doesn't it feel like you're always on? And I'm like, yeah, but in an office, you're also always on. <laughs> like, it's just like, it's just like working together. And you don't have to be there all day, all the time. I mean, you don't have to have it on at night, you know, with your... You know, you know, anyway, you know, there are interesting technologies. And I think that uh, we could do a lot better than the old boring Zoom meeting. Yeah. Or totally. webinar totally. or totally. workshop or, yeah. So coming back to this interactive part. So tell me how to engage people in an online meeting in a way that they get the most value out of it. What interactive parts do you usually use? Uh, I always start with an icebreaker, which people... There's pros and cons. People either hate or don't hate. But the key to a good icebreaker is to make it relevant to the event that you're in. So you don't want to just say, like, go into a breakout room and tell me what is your favorite animal that you feel like in this moment. Right. Like, so, you know, if you're going to be, for instance, if you're meeting and you're going to get a group to brainstorm together, maybe you do an icebreaker that helps people think outside of the box. Like, Here's three images, combine these three random images and make a business out of it. Like just a fun, like what would you do with a broom, a squirrel and a glass of water? You know, like, and so, and what that does is one, it's fun and it gets you starting to think outside the box. Like that's what you, you know, you're warming your brain up for the brainstorming event that's happening next. Now you're kind of focused on like, well, what, you know, what new ideas can I bring into this situation? So That's the key to a good icebreaker. And then for interactive, uh, I find uh, groups of three and four are more mm. comfortable than one-on-one because -on -one. one-on-one one -on -one is, is it can be really awkward. So putting people into groups of three and four. You um, mean for this icebreaker part? Uh, yeah, for the icebreaker. Yeah, for icebreakers or for any breakout rooms. I think mm -hmm. three mm -hmm. to four people is a, is a good dynamic and not too long. Like, I don't want to be stuck in a room with someone for 20 minutes because it's random, right? So my best event so far, the one that everybody's enjoying the most right now is a speed networking event. And it just takes 15 minutes, three rounds, three minutes per round, and then questions designed depending on the event. So I did it for an office yesterday and it was questions designed about how to collaborate better together. Like, how would you, you know, what's your superpower And what's one thing you're trying to accomplish by the end of the year? All interesting information that helps us work better together kind of stuff. So not your favorite ice cream flavor, right? Like those, those things are fun, but it's not, if you're building a good event, you want to build a, a relevant event. So what's, what's going after the icebreaker? After, well, okay. My event format, I have, uh, usually it's, content, exercise, debrief. 
So I will deliver some content, explain a theory. Today we're talking about this. And then we do an exercise around that content to help people internalize it a little bit. So it might be something on a whiteboard. It might be just a discussion. It might be some writing. And then we come back from uh, small group discussions or maybe a liberating structure like one, two, four, all or something. Uh, and then we come back and we do a quick debrief, but really short, like one minute so that everybody just gets a taste from each group and no more than three groups. Because otherwise you, you don't want to do like eight debriefs. Like you don't have to hear from every single group. You just want a taste of a variety of answers. And then you do it again. And the other format tip, the last one I can give on that is uh, take a break after 45 minutes five to 10 minute break in between every 45 minutes, key. People can go to the bathroom, do some jumping jacks, get a, you know, go outside, get some fresh air. It really helps. So um, you do an introduction, then uh, for how long do you usually share some information? Five minutes tops. So like five minutes, you share some information, then exercise? 10 minutes exercise, and then five minutes debrief. Mm -hmm. So it's super fast. Super fast. And I, you know, a lot of people complain in the workshops about uh, like, oh, it's a, well, it's not a complaint, but the feedback we get, it was like, that was a lot of information in a mm -hmm. short amount of time. Other people do things more slowly. I think of when you're online, I want to give the, the principles, the best stuff quickly, and then afterwards give follow-up material so that people can dive into the topic that they found most interesting. I'm getting a rare beam of sunlight here for those who are watching the video, but I don't want to close the window because it's so nice to finally have sun after days of rain. <laughs> finally. So finally. yeah, so so in my workshops, it's more like the interaction part, five minutes of content, 10 minutes of exercise in, or in talking to each other, five minutes debrief, and then on to the next thing. But each topic builds on each other. Like in one workshop, we start with the personal user manual. How do you... How do you stay productive by yourself? Then we on next, it's talking about, well, how do you work together as a team? Once you know what you need, how do you combine that with the team? And then we move on to, well, as a team, how can you work out loud and make your work more visible? And then we move on to like, well, and how do you feel like a team? What kind of, you know, so each thing builds on each other. And by the end, you've had a lot of information. And for the people who already have personal user manuals, maybe they just want to dive into the team agreement but you haven't spent tons of time on any one particular topic. So that's, that's my style. It's not the best. It's just the one that works. That's the one that I like the most. And it sounds really, really fun. You know, like you are not getting bored because you are doing this thing, then you are doing like talking, you're doing exercise and you are once again, listening and talking, doing exercise. And like, how many blocks do you usually have to ensure that it's not too much of information? I do 90 minute workshops with a five minute break uh, in between after 45, 50 minutes. That's it. So, so the feel... icebreaker takes about 15 and then there's like four blocks of information. Mm -hmm. And then the end is another closing out the block. What tools do you use to make uh, event engage in like really, um, I, I, I'm trying to find this word, but like make people to feel that they are inside the, that they are not just sitting in front of the Zoom screen, but they are really in, in inside. I use Wheelo, Wheelo.space, W-E-L-O. That is the, by far the best tool I've ever used for events. No, really, because people can choose, I can break people into rooms, they can choose themselves. It's just the best. Zoom is great. Zoom totally works, but uh, for some reason, you know, people are burnt out with breakout rooms and Zoom and just being zipped back one, you know, it's uh, you want to be able to finish your conversation and your sentence and then return to the group. And Zoom doesn't really allow for that. Got it. And what should a freelancer? So like, I'm really curious uh, on, on behalf of freelancers because you are joining different teams. And um, usually each one, three, six months. So it's like rather fast. And mostly freelancers that I know work remotely. So basically every time, every, let's say in on average three months, they have to join new teams. They have to build new relationships. They have to um, be 
connected to new style of events. So from your perspective, what is the best way for someone who just joined a new remote team to build trust and establish good connections with coworkers? Personal user manuals, hands down. Creating a manual that you can present to other people that shows them what your style of work is like and what your preferences are and some of your non-work hobbies. It depends on you know what you feel comfortable sharing. But for sure, personal user manuals are the easy way. I have a coach that I work with, uh, Dea Woodard, and she also is in, she's a freelance coach, a leadership coach, and she goes from team to team to team, and she uses her personal user manual for um, during the interview process, during the onboarding process, uh, for networking on LinkedIn, like to send it out to people to just show them who they are. And, you know, and I, I tell this story during my talks, my personal user manual, my father-in-law, whom I've known for 15 years now, he uh, saw my manual a couple of years ago, found that I was a fan of Depeche Mode and became a big fan himself. And now we're totally Depeche Mode buddies. So, I mean, I've known him for 15 years. So that is the power of a personal user manual, right? It's just being able to connect with people like that. So for a freelancer, I think it's a great tool. And then when you get there, try to put a team agreement in place, some sort of really simple, like, how are you going to communicate? What are the expected response times? Where are the files? What kind of security protocols? Just like some basic questions. And I think as a freelancer, you can set yourself apart by asking those questions and sort of, you know, just documenting it for yourself and then sharing that documentation with with the people you're working with, because that really makes everything clear. Like, hey, we agreed on, you know, this is what we agreed on. And then people come back and it's like, oh yeah, but I didn't mean that, I meant this, or oh, I didn't realize that this was, you know. Anyway, yeah, and that's- you know, I, and, I, and I really loved reading your personal user manual and I will definitely add it to uh, comments, uh, to description of, of this podcast. So people can also go and get to know you a little better but also see it as an example on how to create uh, the personal user manual for themselves. And, you know, I really wish to have the sky is the limit, but time is the limit. So the final True. question, what is your favorite food? Oh, I, my goodness. So I love uh, burritos and tacos and Mexican food and basically anything that helps me eat avocados. <laughs> I'll take anything with avocado. Until I love avocados. So I guess avocado is my favorite food, but there's something about Mexican food that uh, I just love the salsa, the burritos, the cheese. Uh, I just love all of it. I just love all of it. And what is the best way to connect with you? Uh, you know, for me, I actually prefer, you know, I'm on LinkedIn. LinkedIn's my my social media network that I use, uh, the only one that I use. Uh, but I really prefer email because that's sort of the how I, I get so many messages on LinkedIn and I cannot find everything. I, there's a woman who's emailed me twice that I wanted to respond to and I cannot find the message. So just email me. That's just the, that's the easiest for me. <laughs> got it. Got it, Lizette. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. And it's been such a pleasure to hear and learn from you. Thank you. And thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, hit the like button on five stars and share it with your friend. That's it. We're done. See you in the next episode.